keeping that area sort of free. Hi everyone, I'm Gary Tucker and welcome to my channel. I present weekly demonstrations on painting with watercolor. Many of you have asked about how you can support this channel, take a workshop or attend a class in person. I refer you to the description below. There you can find information on today's subject, ways to support the free content on this channel and links to other resources. Thanks for watching. All right, so to get us started, I've taped down a little piece of paper, divided it here. Uh, on the bottom, I'm going to draw the simple shape of our motif, which is a lighthouse on a bluff. Fence and some houses, or a house. Simple shape. This is giving me something to cut around. In the panel above, I'm going to practice the sky. But to get things started, I'm just going to put a, a very light wash of some um, cadmium orange red, which I think I have it here somewhere. Any red will do. We're going to use it so lightly that we'll har hardly notice it, but we will notice it. And being able to see it so that we can work around it is the whole reason that we're putting this on. So just a light, very light touch. And we just paint those simple shapes of lighthouse and the watchman's house. Simple shape represents our motif for the day. And in fact, there is this hue underlying the, the whole motif. So we're going to use that in our large painting too. Up above though, while this is drying, we're going to practice the sky. Starting with this mop brush, big mop brush. And I'm going to paint um, the sky in a, a graded wash. I'm going to paint the sort of the uncluttered sky first and then introduce some clouds um, across the sky. And in that way, uh, create the backdrop for this scene. We're going to practice painting clouds into a wet area and into a graded wash. So it's kind of a three-step process. We create the graded wash here. We introduce clouds, a cloud pattern, which is very flat near the bottom, rising slightly, and then scattering up above. And then we'll repeat that around our motif, which adds an element of difficulty. So let's start with our blues. We're just going to paint a simple graded wash back here using cerulean blue. In fact, I might get us started with uh, just a little bit of yellow ochre to everything because this is really the color that's everywhere in the sky. You want to get this going quickly. A nice warm hue. Especially towards the bottom we see more of that. Maybe even some of that orange. To 
towards the bottom here. As though it's a sort of sunset sky. And that same light, a very watered down version of this is kind of rising back here. Very, very light. But it does two things. One is it gives us sort of a nice warmth under everything. Two, it makes the page wet. And we want to introduce um, our blue now. I'm going to be using some cerulean, a little bit of ultramarine on top of the warm hues. Let's put a mark down and see how it moves. Not moving too much because it's a little dry up here. Remember, our wash tends to dry from the top down, so we have to be mindful of that. Here. Sort of a three stage graded wash. And it gives us sort of that effect of, you know, transitory sky. Which is what we want. But we want it to stay nice and wet. So so that when we introduce the clouds, they spread out in a wet manner, but still hold their shape. So I'm going to start at the bottom here and work up because the darkest cloud, the darkest cloud is sort of falling along the bottom. It has a bit of red to it, so I'm using some alizarin, ultramarine blue. And what I'm looking for here is consistency, thickness. And just a little bit of gray to it. And it's still a little wet. Let's make it a little thicker. All the while that page is drying, so we have to be careful about it. Now let's uh, introduce a cloud here, see how it moves. So that's pretty good. That's pretty, pretty good there, but we want it a little darker. Just a bit. Similar to what we did the previous week. Small clouds towards the bottom. As these clouds rise, we're going to get a little paler to the top, but this cloud I would like to stand out a little bit. So I'm adding just a little bit of blue to that. Make it come forward just a bit. And then slightly different clouds kind of growing towards the corners in this manner.
Oops, a little too much water. It's real easy to do that, is just add a brush full of water and suddenly the consistency is kind of lost. So I'm just going to put some touches up here of the clouds as they fragment a little bit. want to leave an open space through there if I can. And this is it. Really, this is about it. Even though it's a dramatic sky, this is still going to serve as a background. So we don't have to be too implicit, too direct. The challenge here is to create this sort of cloud movement and still keep that graded wash behind, that light graded wash behind. Okay, let's try that now on to this area, which has dried. And we're going to basically apply it in the same manner, conscious of the transition being just below here as it comes down, finding that yellow reddish color blue, 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 all up above, and then we'll put in those clouds. And I think I'll put a bit more of that red content because I like the, the these lower clouds with a little bit more of the red. Another thing is I'm, I want to keep a nice pale blue behind this area. So this cloud arrives here, some clouds here empty, some clouds from above. You get the idea. So let's remember the process. We started with some yellow ochre, right? And we'll go close without touching. The trick here is to make it feel as though it's passing behind, of course, without going through through the, the object. We're painting around an object, which we do on occasion. This is one such occasion. It's a difficult process to have to break a wash. And there are ways to uh, work around it too. One is to use more of a, use some masking tape or a lot of masking compound. But we're building our skill today, so let's, let's try this way anyway. Maybe we'll end up using masking tape. And you notice that I don't create the shape of the top of the lighthouse, just the cylinder. That's because um, everything above that cylinder is rather dark and um, we shouldn't have to paint around that. We can simply cover it. A little more of that, a little bit of that orange too. We like that orange. Mix it up well. Introduce that. Introduce that. Okay. Keep it wet. We want to introduce that blue now. So we take some of our cerulean. Cerulean has that a bit of yellow with it, so it's got this greenish sense to it. Which is good because our sky has a lot of yellow content. Let's see how that moves.
a little bit more of that. Maybe even a little bit of uh, alt ultramarine with that. We'll go right more, one more here. And let's carry it down a little bit. Sort of like this, we can control that and really place the transition wherever we want. So it's worth to think about where is it really going to be most effective. A little bit more of that ultramarine blue up here. Let's drift down. We want a nice, as smooth a transition as possible. And we want to keep it really very wet while we can. That's pretty close. And we do enjoy that sort of nice sunset quality there. All right, it's time to start mixing our clouds. And I'm looking for a very specific consistency, sort of like uh, almost like heavy cream. Let's try that here. See what it looks like. Perhaps a little more, Let's gray it off a little more and add a little bit more blue to it. Just a touch of water. Anyway, there we go. I'm going to keep changing this to add a little more blue here. Remember, I want to leave something around the top. A little more red here, perhaps. So we're designing with clouds. Of course, we want to get that nice watercolor consistency. You know, the color spreading down in this way just looks good. Okay, let's continue it up to the top, getting a little bluer. Either through uh, ultramarine or even some of the cobalt, either one's okay. A little more water. just looking for a pattern. Doesn't have to be too specific. Even just, you know, placing a touch, letting it spread out a little bit.
good practice, isn't it? Try just to touch. Touch, touch, not stray clouds. Try different ways. But we can add too much too, so let's let's stop there. And one thing to appreciate is that our clouds are still dissolving into the sky a little bit, even up here where it's sort of semi-dry, so that we get a, a variety in clouds and a feeling of their movement across the sky. Looking at the sky that's behind the clouds, also important, just like when we do trees, we leave some um, gaps in the trees so that we can see through. And we have this nice finish down here. In fact, I might add a little more this lower section, just to come against the, the fence. It's very moody in this part of the sky. And we preserved pretty well our shape of the lighthouse. I don't want to touch it up too much. We'll let this dry and, and maybe try a little version of Lighthouse. But this is the main drill today, is to learn how to paint that sky while you're cutting around your subject. And it can be very tricky depending on the complication. Today's subject, in truth, was not uh, too, too varied, you know, too many ups and downs. Um, still some, and it can be tricky. One way around that, uh, as we did in an earlier painting, is to use masking tape. That way we can mask out the area. Sometimes we want a little more freedom, though, with the edges. I don't say that's the case in this painting, but <clears throat> as an exercise, uh, we should know how to do this and what the steps are, how to create that feeling that something's passing behind our bright subject. Okay, well, let's uh, let's move on. Well, we've completed our drill, so we have a pretty good understanding of the sequence that we should follow when we're painting the lighthouse. And I'm going to, at this point, draw the. Uh, foundation uh, for the painting. I am using, um, today I'm using Saunders Waterford 140 Rough, which has a little softer surface, and I found it works better for this technique where we're trying to extend the life of a wash so that we can do, uh, in this case, a little more work in the sky. The arches also is a good paper, but it tends to dry a little faster, and um, so for that reason, I'm using a little different paper today. They both have a rough surface, which enables me to do some dry brush. In any case, starting with a, a light pencil line. In fact, it's almost hard to see on our screen. Um, but rendering the lighthouse, the, the slope of the lighthouse that leads down to the ocean, uh, it rises on the left side, and we see the house of the... Uh, watchmen or the the people that live at the lighthouse. And this uh, lighthouse is in Falmouth, Massachusetts, which is not far from where I live. It's down on Cape Cod. And uh, one of the more beautiful um, lighthouses that I've seen. In fact, I've done a series of watercolors that I'm going to share with you at the end that depict this lighthouse from a different angle and showing you uh, the effect of a morning light, a fog, 
um, and even a night scene, all depicting this particular lighthouse. So it has an importance to me because uh, from, well, from the first time I saw it, I thought it was a great motif. It has a lookout, it looks out onto the ocean, and it's uh, just a well-placed, beautiful, and a high, high point, and catches the light morning and evening. And that's basically what we're thinking about today, or what I'm thinking about today in showing you this painting is uh, recreating the light of the golden hour or the light the, that we see just before the sun descends behind the horizon and uh, cast sort of a golden glow over everything. First things first, though, I want to set up um, the lighthouse basically according to the, the photograph that I'm sharing with you. Because it's a good photograph, it shows us looking up slightly at the lighthouse, we can tell because the upper part is rounded. It's got a um, um, convex shape as we look up. Uh, the slope and the fence both rise towards the lighthouse. The right-hand side is a sharp slope, but it also is moving up towards our main point of interest. It's slightly offset, which means it's not dead center, but slightly to the right in the painting, and you notice I've also squared off the sheet uh, that I'm working on a little bit. I felt that as I was designing this, that the square or a square shape would be a little better um, foundation for this. I felt when I had uh, a lot of room on the left or right, it was excessive, and this allows me to express the height a little more and do more work in the sky and less work on the periphery. So this, this particular format, it's not a complete square, but it's more square than I typically work. Worked out better for this. Drawing uh, the path that leads up to the lighthouse, that's a nice lead in. It really doesn't follow the line that I'm drawing, but um, this line serves a purpose to kind of carry our eye or lead us to our motif, the motif of the lighthouse. And so it, you can see most of the drawing is in that small area. Um, I want to get the architecture. There's two faces of the building that face towards uh, the western sky. And I want to get those uh, drawn properly so that it uh, feels correct and allows me to express the sunlight uh, more directly if we can see those. There's a, a flagpole with a flag that rises up. I'm going to render this also. It's another opportunity really to kind of express the light falling on the scene. But the main character is the lighthouse itself with a single window up above, a doorway and another window down below. A very simple structure um, metallic and all white, so it's perfect for placing some of the uh, glowing hues that we see at this time of day. And not much else to really render for the drawing. We'll put some uh, directionals in the sky to kind of give us a, a uh, road or a map for our clouds, the big masses of our clouds. In particular, I would like to shape the clouds so that they form a little bit of a ring around uh, the uppermost part of the lighthouse. I feel that this is going to be eye-catching to show that dark uh, black metal against the blue sky underneath the glowing yellows and reds of the lighthouse. I've, in my mind's eye, that is really going to be the highlight of the painting. So the shaping the clouds or keeping a bit of space around the top of the lighthouse is important to me. What's going on below is also uh, of importance because it shows the scale. You know, when we see a house 
built next to the lighthouse, we get a, a feeling that this is quite tall, and it is. I'm going to include some figures to the right of the lighthouse, again, to emphasize the scale, and um, use this promontory, this idea of a promontory, which most, most lighthouses have that sort of position where they're up high so that they can cast a wide light over the water. Um, but if we show that slope on the right-hand side and a little bit of slope on the left side, we indicate that this is a rising slope and on a dramatic high point. So these, these features, I feel, are the important ones to keep and the reason that I'm putting a little more drawing, a little more detail, a little more uh, darkness uh, in that area. And everything else around is rather vague at this point. There's not a lot of drawing there, and I'm going to be interpreting that mostly through the color variety, the, the gradations of color that we use in the sky or the slope, or the brushwork that we show in the clouds, the edges that we show along the fence or the uh, softness that we show in the grass, those will be expressed and are important c components to this painting. Don't really need to be uh, shown in detail with the drawing. Just a little bit of indication is enough. All right, well, we have a working idea of how to build the sky. If you remember back to our drill, we started with a pale yellow ochre and built up a very weak wash around the lighthouse. That's the same approach we're going to take to this larger piece. And we've pretty much quadrupled the size. So naturally, we go bigger with the brush. And uh, we try to work quickly in this early stage to isolate the white of the paper with uh, this pale wash and wet the area around the lighthouse so that we can then build the um, color variety into the graded wash. And beyond that, we can then start to place these dramatic brushstrokes, which are going to be clouds. So uh, this first stage is serving two purposes. One is to give a bit of warmth to the sky, and I think that's probably the uh, relates to the mother color, which is this ochre orange color that seems to be behind everything or embedded in just about everything in the scene. Thus, the term golden hour, the, the, the sunlight at this time of the day, is being um, sort of uh, infused with uh, atmosphere. This atmosphere tends to create this golden hue. And shortly afterwards is the blue hour when everything starts to assume a sort of bluish color. Both of these times of day are, are so um, dramatic and so interesting, but difficult uh, to render. Number one, they pass so quickly. And we're almost left to our memory or a photograph to remind us of the the color. And uh, unfortunately, the, the photograph never really captures, in my estimation, never really captures that intensity. The memory has a, has a little better, is a little better reference for me, so I try to rely on that a little more. That in my sense of color and sense of uh, transparency. And in truth, I'm thinking about how this yellow and how the orange that will follow is going to uh, be affected by the yellow underneath and by other colors uh, around it. Well, I'm making use of that wet page. I'm building up uh, the bluish quality in the sky, which is I'm, where I'm using mostly cerulean blue and a bit of cobalt and ultramarine up at the top where I want it to be a little darker. The cerulean is, has a, a yellow component to it, which weds perfectly with this yellow ochre, and they work in tandem very well. 
Uh, but at some point, that sky starts to turn an even deeper blue up towards the top, and left side is where I want to place a little more uh, deeper blue. And I'm using gravity here to make it a really smooth atmospheric transition. This sort of transition, too, I feel, uh, helps to create luminosity. When you see a graded wash like this, um, the light, the expression of light uh, is very strong. Even in this state, you know, even if we don't add clouds, we see a movement of light and the transparency of the uh, sky, a variety in color, and watercolor is doing most of the work here. I'm putting a few brush strokes on and crossing my fingers and uh, kind of painting based on instinct, but watercolor is doing most of the work. Actually, I'll take credit for it a little bit. So you can see the, the slight difference in the blues, right? A little deeper blue, a little more of a uh, rosy blue up on top, a little more of a greenish blue below, especially where it starts to melt into that yellow ochre. All the while cutting around the lighthouse. So this is the difficult part of this particular painting where we're painting a basically a light subject against a dark background. I know that the values are very closely related, but in essence, it's what we're doing. We want to have our lighthouse uh, feel warm and as though it's receiving, you know, the last light of day, glowing with some oranges and some reds. And to do that, we need the white of the paper. We can't pass blue behind this and then paint red off top of it and achieve that sort of glow. The blue will influence that and not in a positive way. And so uh, we have two, well, we have a, more than two options, but two basic options. One is to do it in this fashion where we're cutting around our subject and measuring the intensity of our color against the, the white. Or we can mask this area or mask it partially around the edges. And this is not a bad idea in this case. The reason is uh, the particular shape that we're cutting around is large. Uh, there's a few incidental edges, but it's not that complex. And so putting, even using masking tape to um, mask the edges of the lighthouse, the house, and the slope is not so complicated. And will it would ensure that you can really paint freely in the sky without any worry that it's going to um, move through to the to the, your subject. But I've chosen to do it this way, and so uh, this is another way. A little more complicated, a little more difficult. In some ways, well, in one particular way, I prefer this sort of cutting around because I feel it allows me to stay, well, allows me to kind of keep a Painter, painterly quality to it. If my edges are too mechanical, I feel that detracts a little from the painting. And so if I have a perfectly straight edge, um, it, to me, it contradicts what I want to do a little bit. It's a minor thing. Truly, it's a minor thing, but um, it's the particular way I've chosen to paint this. And so we proceed in this way. Now we're thinking about our clouds. We've got our sky in place and we see the transition happening from that deeper blue to a greener blue to a yellowish color to a deep orange on the horizon. And then as it moves towards the eastern horizon, it's becoming blue once again, just beyond the dip of the uh, slope. Uh, look how hard I'm working to mix up this color. If what I'm looking for is, yes, a color that's going to represent these clouds that are retaining a bit of the warmth of the day, a bit of the warmth of the sunlight, but are largely dark and blue. And the consistency here is super important. So 
I'm mixing it up and looking at the consistency and I put down this mark to kind of test it and I observe how the color moves. If it's not drifting too much, I proceed. And the way I proceed is to really think uh, like a calligrapher. I know that I'm painting clouds and these clouds need to read as clouds, but at the same time, I enjoy the process of painting and want that to be reflected in the brushwork. The sort of energy that's created through uh, calligraphy is, is important to me. So you see how I square off the brush against the side of the lighthouse and extend that oblique movement in the stroke so that it feels like it's really traveling behind the lighthouse. Um, does interrupt the brush stroke, which is not the best of scenarios, but we can trick ourselves into believing that, believing that it works, and um, make use of that. We can we can have the mindset that <clears throat> yes, we're we're carrying through be behind the lighthouse. Physically, we have to interrupt it, but that's. That's mentally we don't. A few touches create those dispersed clouds in the lower part of the sky. Important here to leave, to be able to leave some of that original blue. Uh, just like when we're painting trees, we try to leave some breaks in the foliage so that we can see the blue sky behind. Here, it's just important to paint the masses or the shapes of the clouds and give equal regard to the in-betweens, the parts where we see the open sky. And this way the cloud feels more natural. So we have to think about a few things while we're painting these clouds, and that makes the whole process a little difficult. On top of that, the upper section is drying, so we have to move with a little bit of speed, perhaps more than we're comfortable with. And it's why you see me reaching for that spray bottle on occasion, is because I want to keep that upper section uh, wet enough that I can paint the clouds and know that they're going to spread a little bit. They're going to diffuse a little bit and give me that soft edge that I'm looking for. Here, building up a mass of clouds through uh, brushwork that is showing the underside of the cloud as though it's moving towards the eastern sky, moving in a slightly different direction. So the, the approach we take, the, the stroke that we place, really says a lot about the uh, movement of the cloud and the, and the part of the cloud that we're seeing the way that we're seeing it. So these clouds in the upper part starting to come over the top of our shoulder and move towards the back of the lighthouse, whereas those that are rising behind the lighthouse are already far away and kind of starting to move out across the ocean. So the way we create these, the brush strokes that we use, use uh, really clarifies the position of the cloud in this case. And pretty much, you see they're rather monochromatic. And by that, I mean using a similar color with some slight variations. They're not sunstruck. They do have a bit of that warmth to them. Uh, and that will become more evident as they dry. Uh, the red component in the cloud will come out a little more so that we feel the same sunlight hitting the underside of the cloud as we do striking the lighthouse. Well, at this point, it's come out very quickly, but very accurately. And uh, I studied with Tony Couch years ago, a famous watercolorist from Atlanta, Georgia, who says, uh, in, I think within the first half hour of his workshop, that the cloud should be painted in two minutes or less. Not a cloud, a sky, any sky. And everybody kind of looks at each other and says, really, that quickly? But the point is to do it quickly as a positive statement and then leave it. 
because when we start to try and fix or correct or adjust, um, we lose a little bit of the freshness and lose some of the spontaneity that was generated by the painting of the sky. So I, I remember his voice when I'm creating my skies and I try to finish very quickly with that sense of spontaneity and sense of freshness. And I want you to be aware of the blue that I've left around the top of the lighthouse. This is an important uh, part because it's um, on top of the lighthouse. After, uh, after we paint the, the face of the lighthouse, we're going to add that dark uh, black metal cap where the light itself rests and the railing that encircles the light. Um, and that's going to be quite dark, so it's going to be this nice dark element against this paler blue, which I feel is going to be a real attraction in this painting. And I want to have that sing out. So I've left that space intentionally, and I've shaped it in the manner that kind of uh, echoes the roundness of the lighthouse and, and uh, shows a very natural break in the clouds. Well, now you see me cleaning up some of the edges, um, basically just lifting a little paint and trying to straighten out what I can in this area. Easy to get too caught up in this, so I'm just going to do a couple things and then move on. And really, this, uh, this first stage is nearly complete nearly complete. We can pretty much let this dry from this point and move on to the, the second part. Well, our painting is dried off. We've let it dry and the strokes for the clouds have remained intact. They haven't drifted away. Nice calligraphic feeling. The hues in the lower section have paled a little bit, but they're giving us the transition that we're looking for. Our goal now is to return to this white uh, shape and start to build up the warm hues in our lighthouse. Uh, focus on the upper part and creating that dark tower that I spoke of earlier. Uh, let that feed down into the slope and the pathway and so on. But I'm going to start pretty much in the focal area. I'm going to pick up some of this cadmium red orange hue that I have that's made by Holbein. And that combined with the white of the paper, letting the white of the paper come through this area is crucial. As I said, we can't have anything, well, in this particular instance where we're trying to capture a glowing hue, the white paper works for us. And letting it come through this uh, warm hue of cadmium orange red, or I'm also adding a bit of cadmium yellow just to the top here. And I want to start to build this up and shape the lighthouse and then start to adjust it. So same sort of process where we build up the larger uh, shape first and then while it's wet we make adjustments. The adjustments I want to make are, uh, for example, a little bit of a stronger presence on the bottom of the lighthouse. I want there to be a, a little bit of a shading to the left and right using a cooler color uh, but my first goal is to establish this real strong warm hue in the upper part of the lighthouse and to have some bleeding so that it feels uh, rounded and feels natural. And already that's starting to have a strong effect just because of the warm against the cool. And actually this, this warm hue starts to activate those warmer hues that are in the clouds and certainly the oranges and yellows on the horizon. So we're just by putting this initial layer on, we're already starting to make the other com colors come out a little more. This is one of the sort of the phenomenology of colors. We can 
affect uh, other areas by what we do in this area. A little precision is necessary here because we want to keep a fairly straight line and then as we move into it we want to control the, the gradation of the wash. So I'm using a smaller brush. You see me resting my hand on occasion on the paper for a little stability. And now while it's wet, I'll add a little more of that yellow up above, try to blend it in and let gravity do its thing. At the same time, I'm going to add some deeper hues uh, towards the bottom and blend all these, use gravity to kind of blend these hues in and give it that rounded, luminous quality. It feels a little simple right now because it's just the single color. But when we start to add some of the other colors and it has a chance to dry and we add the dark element on top, it'll feel more like it's a, a sunstruck object. Here's one place I don't want to really expose the white of the paper along the side. I don't want to gap there, so I'm taking a little time to kind of stitch it up and blend the areas. I don't mind taking time here and getting it right before I move on because uh, this is the focal part, the focal point, the area where I'm showing the uh, the narrative, the area where I'm showing uh, the character of the scene, an iconic image. So I want to get it <clears throat> descriptive. I also want to make it uh, vibrant and alive. So I'm trying to uh, create a nice graded wash from top to bottom, a little darker on top, becoming lighter, and then adding some of this alizarin crimson to the bottom to give it yeah, even more depth, even more luminosity. And while it's uh, in this uh, damp stage, I'm going to approach the sides, the rounded sides that are turning away from us a little bit, and just drop with a very small brush um, some of this lavender mixed from leftovers, a little bit of blue, a little bit of red, and just applied to the side uh, of the wet cylinder so that it feels, it'll feel like it's turning a little bit. It's not a dramatic addition, but one that works together with the highlight of the face that's uh, in line with the sun and makes the, the side feel like it's turning a little bit. So we're giving some form, some three-dimensional quality to the lighthouse. And it's starting to look pretty good, starting to feel like a form, like a cylinder. And that's a clear indication to me to kind of step away, start to think to step away and, and um, work in another section. And I think I'm going to work up above and start to paint the strong dark. And I start by creating that edge. And I paint it a little bit into the wet area. I want there to be some bleeding into the top, but I'm using a very small brush, very dry paint, so that the bleeding is really minimized. And I don't want it to flow down too much and lose its strength or to discolor that area. So it's a pretty tricky sequence here where we paint that luminous orange and we follow it with the strong dark on top. The strong dark on top, as I said, was is in a position against the clouds to really um, stand out. And we can paint the features, the railing, the light itself, the, the platform that sits atop the lighthouse. We can do that all in the same color. And this color is mixed from um, that cad orange red and a bit of neutral tint or black. So it's not a pure black, although it appears that way. It has a red component too. And in fact, all the mixtures going forward have a bit of red to it. 
this is sort of the mother color, as it were. Working with small brushes, trying to finish these details uh, pretty much to their conclusion before I move on. If I can paint it to to the conclusion and move on, then I can really uh, let it dry and anything that needs to be adjusted or added can be done after it's dried and sort of um, working with the surroundings. That's the best way to see these various parts is how they work with their surroundings. And as it is right now, it's pretty satisfying against that pale blue sky, uh, luminous red underneath and a bit of red to the black, giving us a nice classic lighthouse shape. So it's a matter of details at this point. Uh, the cap, some of the railing, some of the details, and the light itself. I was in this location some years ago to do a workshop and had occasion to paint this lighthouse a couple of times. It sits right on the um, national, what was it, the national highway that um, goes across the length of Cape Cod all the way to Provincetown. Um, and parallels the coast. So every turn you have a view to the right of the, the ocean and you look left and you see scenes like this of the houses and, and in this case the lighthouse. And it's a really beautiful drive. Uh, this time of year, summer, late summer, it's quite busy. But uh, at the time of day like this, it's going to be a little bit quiet. And uh, you get scenes like this happening throughout the summer. Anybody who's traveled to Cape Cod or lived there for any sort of spell will tell you that this is a common everyday scene. And for us, it's extraordinary. Very much related to uh, the painting that we did last week of Cannon Beach. Uh, we chose uh, the same basic time of day, which is twilight. The sun is fading. We see some beautiful clouds, soft clouds in the sky. The big difference is there we painted a dark um, motif against the sky. So the haystack rock and the other rocks as, and seashore that we painted were dark against the sky. Here we're trying to paint a lighter subject against the sky, which doubles the difficulty. Honestly, this makes it much more difficult because of the, um, well, part of it's painting around or creating that uh, shape, a uh, light shape against the dark, and part of it is measuring the light against the dark. In this case, there's not a big difference between our light shape and the dark of the sky behind, but it still influences the process that we need to take, and that process technically is rather challenging. If we're painting in acrylics or in oils, you know, we can paint this right on top of the sky with no worries because it's an opaque medium. But we're dependent on the white of the paper to, to achieve this sort of glowing color. And because of that, it's, it increases the difficulty, the technical difficulty of this painting. But we don't shy away. We embrace it and we shake our head up and down. Yes, yes, we all know that it's difficult, but worthwhile. So you can see I've extended that alizarin crimson now into the, uh, the house next to the lighthouse. The chimney, the, f the face 
of this lighthouse or face of the house that's facing eastward and receiving a lot of light. Uh, the fence itself, extending that in the form of a little bit of orange and a little bit of alizarin crimson. And we're going to really just load up the orange here and continue it down the slope and give a foundation for the, the next color. The next color to follow this will be a, a greenish hue. We want to paint the lawn that rises up to meet the lighthouse, but we're starting with this um, underpainting of orange and red to ensure that we keep that mother color happening so that we can see it and feel it, and more importantly, feel it, feel the warmth throughout the scene. Um, this is what's being created at this time of day, is that everything is just being imbued with these golden warm hues and uh, reflecting off of other colors, even reflecting off the clouds, uh, saturating cool hues. So this red is really permeating everything. We let that happen with the paint as well. The white that you see, I'm leaving a little bit of white on the fence. I don't know why, just it looks good. It, it's kind of raw right now. I'm going to wait until the end to see if I want to adjust it. Um, the white that's transversing this slope is a path. And it's the path that I'm creating is slightly different than what you will see if you go there. But it's basically the same. It rises from the parking lot up to the lighthouse. And this uh, allows the eye to travel up to the lighthouse as well. So we use it as a visual cue. And we also use it to break up uh, the slope a little bit. There's a lot of interesting stuff on the slope, but overall it's um, a little flat, a little plain. And so having uh, a path climb the slope seems like a good idea and I'm putting it right in front of us so that our eye follows upwards. And I don't want to do too much uh, brushwork in the slope. I prefer to have sort of a soft gradual change from front to back. Uh, there's lots of grasses and rocks that you can see if you visit there. I'm choosing to do simplify that and um, again, kind of keep the interest up above. Use this more as a sort of support or like a, a stand for a piece of sculpture, as it were. This is that green hue, and the green hue is made up of hooker's green and a little bit of ultramarine blue, a little bit of neutral tint. In other words, I've really grayed the green quite a bit. When it comes right out of the tube, it's almost impossible to use. It's just too bright. And any time that I use this sort of green, I try to flavor it with something, flavor it with a little bit of yellow, or in this case, uh, blue. And the underpainting, of course, is uh, affecting the green quite a bit. These are natural complementary hues. And when you layer them, or in this case, when you uh, grade them into the uh, reddish wash, you get some really lovely uh, mixtures happening. You can see that on the upper left-hand side where it, the green pales a little bit and allows that red to come through a little more. Here's a point where I need to decide how much of that to keep. And I'm going to keep a few parts of that red underpainting. I'm not going to hide everything especially on the slope that leads up to the lighthouse. I don't, I want the, the light to feel as though it's traveling upwards. And so I'll put a little bit of that green and leave, you know, a good amount of the red as well. But I compare that to the right-hand side where <clears throat> there's quite a bit of blue being added and a little extra green so that it feels like the shady side 
the side that's receiving just a little less of the light. Well, it's coming together, you know, we can uh, certainly feel light, warm light on our subject, glowing quality. Not a dramatic light at all. I mean, by that I mean not a brightly sunlit day, but more that sort of somber, golden, glowing hue that you feel um, <clears throat> in the twilight hour where things are in transition the light of the day still remains, the warmth of the day, you can touch the ground and it still feels warm. You touch a stone, it still feels warm. Especially on the side that faces the sun, you touch the other side and it's cool. So uh, this time of day is dramatic on a lot of levels. And I really favor this time of day, especially if I compare it to high noon. High noon is is very dramatic. It's also very a little plain, uh, a little simple by comparison. I like the early morning, um, early morning light or this late afternoon light. Those are the two types of light that I'm really drawn to. I also like the light that you notice when the season is changing, and. Um, at this time in Massachusetts, we're in early September, but already we can feel fall has taken a hold. And it's not because the, the temperature has gone down or uh, we notice a, a dramatic change in the weather, but uh, we do notice the change in the light. The sun is now lower in the sky. It's rising a little later. It's setting a little earlier. And d different things are happening. Um, birds are coming out a little later. Crickets are in full swing. I was walking in the garden. Uh, the, the public, not the public gardens, the Fenway Victory Gardens, which is a beautiful place near, near my apartment. And the crickets are just roaring. They're so lively. All the gardens uh, are cared for. And they seem to come out right at this time, just as the temperature is getting a little cooler and there's just a little chill in the air. This seems to really stimulate the crickets. Of course, if you're walking in the midday sun, you hear a different sound. You hear the cicada. They're just starting to disappear right now. So there's, this is a time of year when there's a lot of changes going on. And certainly light is one of them. As a plein air artist, I'm often asked, why do you do that? Why do you, why don't you just paint in the studio? It's so much more comfortable. You have everything you need, no distractions. And all of that is true, of course. It's, it's a, very comfortable and fun to paint in the studio. I enjoy painting in the studio, but I really enjoy going outside and standing in a scene like this and trying to capture it. There's a challenge to capturing it. But uh, I guess beyond all that is uh, that we, when we do that, we have a chance to really take notice of the subtleties of light around us. And... I know that my painting has definitely benefited from all the plein air experience that I've had. Uh, it's just sharpened my senses and sharpened my visual memory too as to how the light changes, what's, uh, what's occurring uh, during these changes, and how I can cre recreate that in the painting. certain things I wouldn't have noticed any other way. Um, in, in when you're standing in front of your subject for, you know, an hour, hour and a half, really uh, concentrating, you're not only doing a painting, but you're also sort of through osmosis taking in a lot of the experience. And that can be a memory that you draw upon later. 
or a sensation that you draw upon later when you're doing a painting in the studio. So all this does bear fruit. It might not turn out the way that you like in the field. And in fact, doing a painting in the field is quite a bit more challenging, especially for watercolor when it's drying so fast, we have to really adjust our technique, which is not pleasant. But what you absorb and what you take away from you is invaluable and has really made a big difference to me and many of the artists that I know would tell you the same thing, that it's a very important part of their, their consistent painting experience. In other words, they go out into the field regularly. Well, it's something that um, the Impressionists gave us, is a return to study in nature and I believe it's one of the painting one of the reasons that their painting still has a huge popularity is still um, respected and loved by so many people is because it contains that quality of light sort of the essence of light uh, is in their painting and they were very true to the idea that one needs to stand in front of their subject and be sensitive to what's happening with the light as it's falling on the subject and record that as best we can. I say as best we can because when we compare it to nature, of course, we're always on the short side. But we can bring some other qualities too that um, nature doesn't give us, uh, such as a way to express uh, our love of brushwork, or look at the color that's happening in the lawn. This is a little bit of an abstraction from what the reality is, but it kind of makes a bridge between what we feel as human beings and what we observe in nature as a phenomena. And I think this is where painting really uh, becomes something important because it spans both worlds. It's has a root in our human experience, our, hum our human uh, nature, and also has a root in uh, the beauty of the outdoor world, the beauty of nature, etc. In any case, we're painting a fence, like Tom Sawyer. We're not putting on the whitewash, we're just painting in between some of the slats to give the sort of pattern that we see in a picket fence. It was one of the features that I really like about <clears throat> this particular location is that white fence that travels along the slope and uh, this white fence is also absorbing and reflecting that luminous color of twilight. So I'm adding a few details there. I've darkened up the roof a bit, especially close to the lighthouse where we can make it give it a little point of attraction there. And at this stage, working with a really small brush, a uh, small sabalette with a point. I go between this brush and <clears throat> a small flat, quarter inch flat brush that doesn't carry a lot of liquid, but gives me some edge control and also gives me uh, the ability to make some fine lines if I need to. And what I'm doing now is, you know, stepping back pretty consistently to to sort of measure the detail, how much detail do I need, uh, how much is helpful, and uh, where do I need it. I know that I have to do some work in the path, and my plan is to wait for the, uh, the green color to dry a little more, and then place uh, a little bit of that blue from the sky into the path, as well as a little bit of uh, the rosy color. So we'll finish off the path so that it blends in a little more. And that's the only thing that's really standing out as something that needs to be done uh, to my eye. Trying to create a little more of a form to this uh, house, both the pitched roof and the uh, inset of the building so that the two facing parts of the building 
shine a little more. Okay, well, it's starting to have that finished quality. I'm searching for things to do right now. This uh, lower section is dried to a point where I feel I can add the, the doorway, add the window. There's some banding that um, circumvents the tower. Uh, these little details, of course, they, they need to be added when the paper's dry. And probably should be added, you know, once the uh, image has started to really mature and you can judge a little better how dark to make them, how skinny, how broad to make the strokes, etc. This is one area that's giving me a little problem. You can tell when I start to spend a, an inordinate amount of time back and forth, back and forth. In any case, we touch up the details and It's bringing back some memory of that day. I think we finished a, a, a day of painting along the uh, National Seashore, looking out towards the ocean. I remember specifically we were seeing a lot of monarch butterflies on this day, and none of us really wanted to leave. We are exhausted from painting but still enjoying the view and enjoying the transitions that we are seeing and so I think we just sat down and did nothing for a little while Oops. Okay, well, we're adding just a few more touches here, lightening that area a little bit by lifting some of the color, still preserving the glow. The balance is pretty good here. And probably I'll finish this by doing a few details um, into the lighthouse. I'm still not sure about that slope, whether I want to add something such as a, there is a, if you see it from this vantage, you'll see there's a little bit of a house and a tree that you can see just as the slope moves down to the ocean. But I kind of like that dramatic quality also, so I may just leave it like that. And also, we want to put a couple of figures on the right-hand side. There's a little patch of yellow sky, if you see, to the right of the lighthouse. It's a perfect place to put a couple standing figures looking out towards the ocean. We'll do a little bit of calligraphy as we create the banding that... Uh, hmm. I guess holds this structure together. In any case, it gives us another feature to include that's minimal and yet helps us to create the illusion of form.
and the figures are very tiny. Their heads just, uh, shoulders and heads just visible. The body kind of disappears into the lower section. And it, even if, if they're hard to find, there's, that's not a problem because they're a com sort of a complementary component to the painting. All the values are very closely related here, except for that strong dark that really pulls the eye upward into the upper third of the lighthouse. And this is consistent with this time of day. There's not the strong contrast that we see on a brightly lit day. We tighten up some of the edges, hide some of those whites. And this is the painting. This stage, what I want to do is uh, some more details. I'm going to put a little bit of a wash of um, you see the wash of blue that we used on the path. I'll put a few accents of red there. I'm going to paint some light areas. I'm using a little bit of body color or opaque color. Uh, in this case, mixing a little white with the red so that I can get some bright edging to the buildings and kind of pronounce that glowing color just a little more using a skinny brush and there's a nice trim on on the fronts of the of the buildings that um, is reflective so we're putting just a little bit of that color at the peak of the roof to make it a little brighter i think i'll use some of the same color in the flagpole to make it stand out a little bit Again, this is a mixture of that cad orange red or cad red orange uh, that I've been using throughout the course of this painting and a little bit of uh, white or titanium white. And I'll put a few more accents here and there. Um, a little spark in the top of the lighthouse um, a dash of that color in the fence here and there. I'll add a couple touches, but it's not the kind of color you want to use too much. Excuse me. All this talking has taken some of the oxygen away from my brain, so I need to yawn. Well, this is just about doing it. I don't want to do much more than this. Well, thank you for watching to the end. I hope you found this content interesting and inspiring. Have a look at the description below to find out more about this project, or click the banner up above to visit my webpage and learn about workshops and in-person classes, as well as other important resources.